All right, so we were just talking about Faraday's law of induction as well as Lenz's law, the law that states that if you have magnetic flux that changes through a loop, there's an induced current that opposes that change. So if the uh, magnetic flux through this loop increased in this direction, we would get a, a current in the loop that would oppose that change. So we'd get current then going the opposite direction to oppose that change. But what if current flowing through this loop created a magnetic field. So if we had current flowing around it this way, that would create a magnetic field out towards you. And because there's a magnetic field towards you, that means there's a flux that's changing through the loop. And because of that, it would induce a current in the coil to oppose that change in the opposite direction, sometimes called a back EMF. And this is inside of a loop like this. It will induce a current inside of itself because of the current that's flowing inside the loop. It's a weird concept. And this is called self-induction or self-inductance. It's that an, in, an inductor creates a current inside of itself. And this is then called an inductor because it's something, it's a loop of wires. Really any loop of wires would be considered an inductor. This is a coil of wires that I've been using to wire up some stuff in my basement here. And um, you can see it's just loops and loops and loops of wire. And as current flows around this, it creates a magnetic field in this direction. And the magnetic field from each individual of one of these loops goes through all the rest of the loops and it magnifies the effect. And so this is what a typical inductor looks like. It's a loop of wires that just travels around. And this is another circuit element that we're gonna be talking about. And so if we look at the symbols of this, uh, an inductor looks kind of like this. It's like a coil. It looks like a little curly Q, uh, something like that. And we will be looking at those here shortly. But the big thing that this does is it slows down the flow of electricity. Rather than when you flip a switch, it immediately turning on, an inductor will make it sort of slowly ramp up to its new uh, maximum value. And so it kind of works against current flow. It slows down current flow. It impedes the change of current. It likes current to flow the same way through it continuously. So let's look a little bit at some of the equations that we've got here. So this is our first equation for an inductor. It says that the induced EMF is equal to, and there's a minus sign in there, but you can mostly ignore that with, when we're talking about these, it's just talking about direction. Um, it's equal to, the, to L, some constant L, uh, times di dt. So it tells us that Based on the geometry, the shape of this inductor, it's going to have some constant that tells you how much induced EMF is proportional to the change in the current, the time derivative of the current. And that letter L is our inductance. Of course, we use the symbol L because inductance starts with an L. And then if we think back to our Faraday's law of induction, this is the one that we looked at just a little bit ago, uh, n is equal to d phi dt, the changing magnetic flux is a function of time. And if we sort of combine both these equations together and then solve for L, we get that the inductance is equal to n d phi b over the current. So, or sorry, not d phi, just phi over the current. So this is equal to the flux over the current times n. And it seems weird that this would depend on the flux and the current because it actually does not depend on the actual values of either of these. It depends on the ratio between the two, which is actually comes out to be a physical constant of the object, just based on the dimensions, the number of turns, that sort of thing. Uh, because the current, this depends on that, so this ratio is the thing that, that matters here. And so then overall, if we go ahead and combine, go back to the first equation and just solve for L, we get that L is equal to that induced EMF, the amount of force, the electromotive force backwards inside of the loop, divided by di dt, the time derivative of the current. And so this is sort of the, the fundamental thing inside of this is that we're talking about how much does it resist a change in current. Inductors like to have the same amount of current flowing through them. So let's take a look at a simple circuit, this one right here. As you can see, we've got a battery, uh, a switch, a resistor, and our little inductor there. So if we have it open like this, it means the current in this resistor is zero, the current in this inductor is zero. And when we close the switch, then we would, would expect, if the inductor was not there, that the resistor would just immediately get full current. But what happens is this inductor 
going from zero current to a large amount of current, that's a large change in current. And so we would say that uh, di dt in that case would be pretty large. And so that means that the backwards EMF across this guy here would be pretty large. So that means the voltage across this is large and very small amount of current starts to flow. But now the, as some current's already flowing, now this, this current isn't changing so much. So the, the inductor doesn't fight back quite as much as it continues to change. And eventually it reaches whatever the maximum current is and the changing current in here is zero now because it's reached a steady state. And so now the inductor kind of goes away. So it's kind of a little bit backwards of a capacitor where a capacitor lets current flow at the beginning and then blocks it at the end. An inductor blocks current flow when it changes and lets it stay at a steady state flowing without any resistance. And then what would happen is if we went through and we went in and, and uh, put in like a short circuit from here to here, an alternate path for current to flow, uh, we would expect that now all the current from the battery would just go through that wire and none of the current would be flowing over here anymore. But since this inductor already has current flowing through it, it wants to keep pushing current through. You can kind of think of it as like, uh, like inertia where it's, it's got, it's kind of like current inertia. It's pushing this electricity through the circuit. So it would continue to push current through this resistor even after the battery was removed. If you removed the battery entirely, but just had this loop going on its own, then the inductor would continue to push current through the resistor until it eventually decayed back down to zero to having no current flowing through it. And then nothing would happen in the circuit anymore. So it's kind of a weird situation, but that's what happens here. And inductors are uh, a little strange in this way. It's, it's something that uh, it's actually is, is kind of dangerous to remove, like to immediately cut off a circuit. If you do that sometimes, you can get that the inductor wants to push current so hard that it continues to want to push current through, but there's no path for it to go to, that the, um, the voltages just jump crazy high and you get these ridiculous arcs and sparks of electricity. So if you've ever unplugged an electronic from the wall and noticed a small spark, it's because of the inductance that's going on in that circuit that it wants to continue to push charge through uh, so it gets high enough that you can actually see a spark from it. And here I'll see if I can splice in a video here of this happening for um, an electrical power line. When they disconnect the switch, you can get these giant arcs. So it's, it's pretty severe and you can see why this stuff uh, actually matters in that case. So one last thing, we can also combine a capacitor with an inductor. So here we've got a capacitor and an inductor. Right when we connect these two, if we've got the capacitor charged and we connect it to an inductor, it would start to discharge through the capacitor. The capacitor really wants to push charge, but the inductor doesn't want to let charge flow through. And so it's kind of resisting it as we go. So we get a small amount of charge and eventually it'll start to let some charge through. And then what'll happen is this current will continue to increase and increase and increase until these two plates are at equal potential. And then this capacitor won't be doing any more pushing. It won't push charge through at all anymore. But what does happen is now the current will start to decrease, but the inductor says, no, 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 no. You can't just stop like that. I'm pushing charge. I'm going to keep pushing charge. So it keeps pushing the charge through, keeps pushing the charge through, and then we get a buildup of charge on the bottom plate. Positive charge down here, negative charge down here. And what we're starting to see is simple harmonic motion because now the bottom plate is positively charged, the top plate is negatively charged. It's going to push charge back through here. Once it's going through here, this guy doesn't want to stop pushing, so it keeps pushing. And we get this oscillation of charge back and forth. And this doesn't just look like simple harmonic motion, it's exactly simple harmonic motion. The differential equations and the math is literally exactly the same as, as a block and a spring. So this kind of is like your inertia term, kind of like the mass of the object. This is kind of like your spring. Uh, and so actually, if you just replace the value C with one over K from your spring constant and the value L is the mass, uh, then you actually get literally exactly the same equations if you just replace those two letters in the simple harmonic motion equation for a spring. I think that's pretty darn cool. So this is pretty much the end of uh, the material for 
for our class. There's one or two little things we're going to look back at from last semester. We'll do a little bit of practice with some of the circuit stuff. Um, in a college class, you probably would combine all of these together, resistors, inductors, and capacitors, into uh, one kind of circuit. And then you kind of get that same sort of damped mechanical oscillations pattern and stuff that we learned back in simple harmonic motion. Um, but we're not going to talk about that uh, in here this year. Um, I think that that's all I've got for you today. Thanks.